Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me once again for another session of the Kingdom. We're back again, and we're picking up on part three of what I promised you in this teaching on the first step in enter into, entering into the Kingdom. The first step of entering into Kingdom, how to enter into Kingdom living. And so we're here picking up, hopefully, this is the final phase of this three-part teaching on how to enter into Kingdom living. For those of you joining for the first time, thank you. Welcome aboard. You're in for a journey. For those of you who have been with me, been staying with me, hearing these messages, my hope is that you're growing, you're learning, and that by now, if you're not already in to the knowledge and research and investigating the kingdom, you are already in. And so tonight, we're going to pick up the final three pages or four pages remain after my notes to get you understanding how to enter into kingdom living. By the way, at any time, you can go back and listen again to this teaching on the concept of how to enter into the kingdom. And as I keep on introducing each week I come on, this is on a daily basis. We now live out the kingdom on the earth as citizens of God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is now. It's not down the road. It's not in the future. While that's the established rulership and reign of God on the earth when he sent back his son, the idea is that we have to learn to train in this present world in time so that when that kingdom rule come, we can rule with him. So this is our training ground. We thank you for those who are joining me. For those of you who never sat in one of my sessions, I always encourage you to go back to my older teaching from Facebook and or YouTube on our Google Spotify. And there you'll find my teaching on Introduction to the Kingdom. And I'm usually teaching a progression, so I always recommend go back to the oldest teaching to the newest one. And so as you come forward, you're going to gain knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Hey, Ruthie, welcome aboard. And so we're in for the final session tonight. Got a lot of material to cover. I want to hit the ground running tonight. <clears throat> and I'm hoping to finish up this series on introduction and how to enter into the kingdom of God, the basic steps that are necessary. I think last week I spoke to you in the last part of my session, I talked about, <clears throat> was I asked a question. At the, point, I, I, at the end of my teaching, I asked the question, my question to all those who are reading this or listening to this teaching, and the question I asked was, what gospel are you preaching? And if it is not the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached and taught, then odds are you might be preaching the wrong gospel. Because if you preach, as I said before, if you preach the gospel without the kingdom, you're preaching a half-truth. Most never ask themselves the question because they've been convinced that the gospel is the message. The gospel meaning good news. But this good news must be of something. And thus I can encourage you to continue to study out, to research what I'm telling you, that the message of Jesus was the good news of the kingdom of God is present with you. And I made this statement last week. If you're teaching and preaching the kingdom of God, then you are in great company. You're on the right track. It would lead you straight to your eternal destiny in the presence of God and to come back to the earth to rule and reign with him. This is where we left off last week. Now let me pick up from there. So the gospel of the kingdom of God is a vital issue today. The gospel of the kingdom of God is a vital issue. It is a heads-on and the total answer to man's total need right now. Why, what it isn't, what the kingdom of God isn't, is a religious service, or tradition, or custom, or a cliché. Because most are hearing the message, and they're using the word kingdom, but they have no concepts. And I'm concerned about that, because they think they can just attach, bumper sticker, attachment, tack it to the word kingdom, and think they got kingdom. I'm here to terminalize kingdom finance, kingdom ministry, kingdom this, Kingdom sale, kingdom advertisement, kingdom company, kingdom books. I'm hearing these terminologies, but I say over and over again, if we're using the word kingdom without a revelation or understanding what a kingdom is, we are misrepresenting that kingdom. We just attach it to a religious box or card and think that by attaching it, it makes us okay with God. And it is not. Because the kingdom is a totally different instrument or vessel than the gospel message without the kingdom. The kingdom of God does not mix with religion. When the kingdom of God show up, it creates naturally what is called a conflict. It opposes it because the kingdom of God comes in truth and by revelation, while the gospel comes through men's knowledge and their own understanding and through training. I'm not opposed to those things, but the idea there's a deeper level of understanding we need to have to represent the kingdom of God. So what I'm telling you is that what the kingdom of God isn't is a religious service. Go to church. 
It is not tradition passed on through history. It is not a custom we follow. This is the custom of our culture and nature. It is also not a cliche. Never before have we needed to preach the unshakable kingdom of God as now. Now, why is now important? Because we see men going off the rail. We see most religions not functioning right. We see preachers who are violating God's law. We see people that are making bad decisions, are using the name of God, and the example that's being seen by most people turns them off from the gospel message. So never before have we needed to preach the unshakable kingdom of God as we do now. There are people in our world that will not enter into a building called a church or never become what they call a Christian or a believer today because of the bad example that they've seen, the misrepresentation from people in their lifestyle, how they live in the building. Thus, they will reject the name of God, not because they want to, it's because they've seen hypocrisy. We see people talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. We hear them give us the word, and they say wonderful things, but their lifestyle doesn't match up. Thus, most people are turned off by this message of the church. And that's why the kingdom of God is so need, desperately needed today. For never were the pillars of civilization shaken like it is now. Our foundational truth, our belief system is being tested right now. What we have believed about God, men are pushing the limit on the envelope of righteousness. They're using things like situational ethics. If it feels right, look right, we'll do it. And with no, no fear of consequences or a price they'll pay for the choice that they're making in the moment. For because the gospel of the kingdom is coming back, coming back out of sheer necessity. If we continue on this path that we're on right now without the kingdom revelation of truth and knowledge, the world will be led to destruction. And thus now is the right time for the kingdom to, to, to come up and to manifest itself because most of what we taught in religions doesn't work. It is not working. The words that we have spoken, we have not seen the fruit of it. We pray there's no result. We read the Bible, we don't get understanding. We go to church and we do the ritualistic things, but it doesn't pan out in our real life. When we at home, our family situation is not getting better in many cases. I'm not opposed, I'm not attacking the church, understand me. But the ideas of what we have seen, what we have rep seen represented by men, is not panning out in the lives of people. Um, this Jesus that we talk about, from the religious perspective, doesn't work. He doesn't show up when you need him. When you pray to God, it seems like he doesn't hear. When we're hurting, he doesn't manifest himself. When we ask him something, he doesn't seem to answer. We don't know why. And thus, for many, that's why the kingdom of God is now so important and is so necessary today. Because why? People are hurting and is seeking for a better way. Now, the question we must answer, why is the kingdom the total answer to man's total need? Why is the kingdom... The total answer to a man's total need. And the simple answer is because the kingdom of God answers the how and the why question of the Bible and, and of life. Let me say it again. Why is the kingdom the total answer to man's total need? Because the kingdom answers the how and why question of the Bible and life. In the kingdom, you will find your identity. You will find your purpose. And when you find those two, they will lead you to your destiny. If you seek and find it, it will lead you to why you are created and what you're created to do. Once you find purpose, then life and this world will start to make sense to you. Because when you understand the principle of building the kingdom living, and you start to align yourself up with the principle of walking obedience to God's created law, then life works for you instead of against you. The reason why people are struggling with life, and they're saying life is hard, or this world is terrible, is because they're in violation of the created laws built into nature and built into our world. And once you rub up against it the wrong way, it will burn you, it will prick you, it can bring injury to you. You don't know a law exists until you run into it, right? For instance, you and I know that when it comes down to a sidewalk and there is a little step up the sidewalk, if you don't pay attention and you're not watching, right? It's there. The warning is that you step up because if you go straight ahead walking on a flat ground and you come to the ridge and you bump into it, you're going to jam your toe, you're going to curse and you're going to hurt. Why? Because the sidewalk is there to hurt you? No, because you're not, you violate the law of walking and so doing your rub against the silent law and it hurts. Hi, Jennifer, welcome aboard. And it will hurt you. And thus the reason why the kingdom of God so desperately needed today is because in the kingdom you'll find the how and why. 
to life. It will answer and help you find your identity, your purpose, which will lead you to your destiny. Keep in mind now that the kingdom of God is within you. Mm. Most hear that, they have no comprehension or understand what I just said. The kingdom of God is within you. In the very laws of being, of your being, it is there. Now, how do you know that the kingdom of God is within you? And how do you know the laws built within you? Can I give you the scripture? It's in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 through 13. I'm going to read it to you. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 through 13. That the laws that I'm talking about, keep in mind, the kingdom of God is in you. But you, most people don't know that and they don't know what it is. That's why I'm here defining these terms for you. So when I use the word kingdom, you understand what I'm trying to tell you. Now, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 through 13 says, For this is that, that first covenant that had been, that, let me read that again. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been found for a second. Because find fault with them, he says, Behold, the day are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when they took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant you and I are under today. Read, I'm going to read it to you. This is the covenant you're under. For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will now take the Ten Commandments that the children of Israel had violated. I will put now that law in their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them will teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord. Ah, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Very important word. What's he to your unrighteousness? Graceful? No. He shall be merciful. So when you sin, you don't get grace. You get mercy like I've been saying all along. I am merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sin. So when you sin, you get mercy. You don't get grace. See right there? And their lawless deed I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what has become obsolete, grows in all and ready to vanish away. So here we see that keep in mind that the kingdom of God is within you and in the very law of your being because the law is now written in your mind and in your heart. It is also amongst you. In this entering the kingdom, the law of the kingdom of God is among you in the relationship we have with each other. And it is at your door. The kingdom of God is at your door. It is ready to break into you and your relationship and remake or transform you. So, it is all three. Number one, the kingdom is within you. It is amongst you and at your door. It is a present. It is present with you. But most don't know how to step into it or to activate it. Thus, they're struggling unnecessarily because they don't realize they are the carrier of God's kingdom. Now, what is the simplest definition of carrier of the kingdom of God? I said it to you last time, right? It's in the book of James. It's the book of, um, I think Timothy. I don't remember the name of the book, but there, I, I don't remember the name I gave you, the scripture I gave you. But the idea of the kingdom of God summed up in this. The kingdom of God in you is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the simplest definition. That means that's within you. Now, who's the one who will lead you in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit of God is the empowerment given to you that dwells within you. The reason why the kingdom is present with you because the Spirit of God dwells within you. You and I are God's temple. And so he lives in us and he works through us. So the kingdom of God is within you, it's amongst you, and it's even at your door. However, if you don't make a conscious choice to change your mind, change your thinking, and to step into kingdom living, it could be right there with you, and you're still not walking in it. Because see, the problem with us is when we get a religious mindset, we accepted Jesus, we think that's all we have to do is to accept Jesus, come to Jesus, hang with Jesus, and we're good. We have to do any more to enter the kingdom living, to overcome life. That's where we make the mistake. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to my father. That means you don't come to Jesus. You come through Jesus to go to the father. Oh. Wow. Very important word that most are missing out on. So most reckon that don't recognize the kingdoms within. It's amongst you. And it's at your door. And if it's in you, they don't know how to activate. Hey, LA, welcome aboard, my friend. Now, let me give you the 
18, the, the Constitution of Scripture, Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 through 4. To show you, Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 through 4. At that time, the disciple came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Right? So in other words, if the kingdom is within you, amongst you, and at your door, how do you enter into it? Here's a simple question. So in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 through 4, at this time the disciple came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, unless you repent, repent there doesn't mean repent of sin. Repent there means, that is, change your inner self, change your mind, change your old way of thinking, and live a changed life. Mm. And become like a children or a little child. The definition here of the children, I have to def de define that, is that the children are trusting, they are humble, and they are forgiving. And they're willing to ask questions. Mm. You, he said, if you don't become like this little child, adults, he's talking about here, by the way. He wasn't talking about children. Most people read the scripture and said, he's talking about some of the children come unto me for a bit enough for such the kingdom. They don't understand he wasn't talking about the child. He said, as an adult, you who are now experiencing life, you who have gone and have a relationship with God, in order to enter into this kingdom, to activate it in you, because if it's within you, you don't know how to activate it. If it's amongst you, you don't know how to operate in it. And it's at your door, you don't know how to enter. He said, you must renew your thinking. Change the way you think. Humble yourself. Become as a little child, right? And become like a little children. And he said, if you don't become like that little child in renewing of your mind, you will by no means enter in the kingdom of heaven. You see it there? That's the process. Become childlike again. One of the reasons why we are hesitant to step into it is because we have been convinced that if we receive Jesus, hear the gospel, we're good. So we settle, right? We, we don't think there's any more. We got everything we need to know. We think we're good with God. So why do we go any deeper? Yet I'm here to tell you there's a, such a thing as the life as a citizen to receive some rights and benefits and to live at a higher level and higher standard. Therefore, whosoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He was not talking about a child. He was talking about the adult that needs to become a child again. That's the story of Nicodemus that I gave you last week. He must become a child again. He asked the natural question that flesh would ask. And you mean I must enter my mother's womb all over again to be born again? How can these things be? In his rational thinking, and that's where most religious people think, how do you mean become born again? Well, I'm born again. I accepted Jesus. And the Lord said, yes, you did. However, how about taking the next step? Humble yourself like a little child. Go to God and say, God, I don't know. Would you teach me and allow the Holy Spirit to become your teacher? And as you humble yourself, you have to go back and study and research and investigate everything you were taught. And by that doing, you gain more knowledge, understanding, wisdom as to who you are, who God is, and how the kingdom functions within you. And once you start gaining knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, you will operate at a high level. You will understand the process of sin and how to be an overcomer. Mm, Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus was speaking, he says... Asking Peter, who do men say that I am? Hi, mom. And then some say, some say Moses, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets, who do say I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus responded, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And upon this rock, the word Peter means rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against them. So in other words, he said, the people that I want to operate the kingdom is the one I've chosen to operate by revelation and truth, a revelation of who the Christ, the anointed one, the breath of God is. He will lead you and guide you in all truth. So Hebrews chapter 7 verse 13 says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. In other words, saying, I will come and teach you myself. I've trusted man and they misinterpret Ten Commandments. I'm going to take the Ten Commandments off the stones. I'm going to put them in your mind and in your heart and I will come and teach you. Thus the reason for the comforter, the teacher, the helper called the Holy Spirit. What well, is his job? To keep us in alignment with God's commandments. So he says there's only two commandments that you need to follow in the kingdom. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Master these two commandments, and you have met all the requirement of all the law. His job is to get you and I to love God and love people as you love yourself. Hmm. 
That's the key to kingdom living. You're an overcomer because you could then call walking in righteousness, right? Let's continue. So we now see Jesus says, if you're going to enter into the kingdom, you have to become a child again. He's speaking here not to the children because children just believe. Children just follow. Children have hope. Children come with questions. He's talking to adults who have life experience, who have been programmed to think a certain way, who have maybe had some traumas in their life, maybe came to the Lord in crisis, and they want to live the overcoming life to overcome their trauma. And so they know said for you to be renewed. Your mind and your thinking need to be renewed. The way you approach the scripture and what they've told you need to be renewed. You need transformation in your life. That's kingdom living. Constitution of Scripture, another one, Luke eleven twenty. But if I cast that demon with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Proven again that the kingdom of God has come upon you. So it's within you, it's amongst you, it's at your door, and it has come upon you. Ah. So the priority of every believer is to seek the kingdom. The kingdom of God is, in essence, God's redemptive reign in your life and mine. We are citizens of God's kingdom. We are subject to the authority of the king. Yet it can be as easy as overlooking this prominent theme in the life of Jesus. And it's tempting to assume rather than to investigate the importance of the kingdom for Jesus. Most of us are assuming things, but we don't investigate. We don't research. We just assume. We don't study out this kingdom that Jesus preached. He preached only one message, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. It is up to us to investigate and to study and ask the question, what was Jesus' only message? He only preached one. I still don't get it how the church never got it. And mankind don't understand. He didn't preach four or five messages. Now, some of you have been saying, but Gary, you can look stream there. You mean you don't preach one message. He preached different things. Yeah, he preached different things. But the main thrust of what he preached was out of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. And he gave you an example of that. It's like a mustard seed. It's like two men in a uh, fishing. It's like the, the, the wheat. It's like uh, the seed falling on certain ground. It's always a demonstration of the kingdom. Out of everything he spoke came out of the kingdom message. So we need to understand when we miss the significance of the kingdom to Jesus, we can miss the significance of the kingdom for biblical righteousness and biblical obedience. You see, no kingdom want law-breaking citizens. They want law-abiding citizens. Hmm. So if we don't get this concept right, you're not fighting me. You're fighting that the only message that we claim to be our example. And if he tells us, if he is a standard of righteousness, he's a standard of obedience to the Father, he's the witness that demonstrate power, then why would we miss out on his message? Isn't that just as important everything as he did? Remember, he said before he did anything. So why aren't we listening to his word? So we're going to pick and choose when we're going to obey him? Hmm. So we preached a message. We need to ask a question then. What was his message? What did he preach? And if, if, if this message is a kingdom, then what message should you and I be preaching? The gospel? Mm. This is where we're missing it. We're preaching the gospel without the kingdom. And thus me, most people in life are looking like it's in shambles because the gospel is good news. If the message is the good news without the kingdom, then you're going to have to put your own interpretation of what that gospel means, which is what we're seeing. They said the good news is now of healing, deliverance, naming demons, Leviathan, different name they're using, and Python spirit, and the, the, the prophets, and the prophesying, and all these weird things we're doing. Let's be clear about one thing. Jesus demonstrated those signs of wonder. Not because that was a message. It's because the kingdom of God was present with them. And thus the sign one to manifest to prove to you the kingdom is present. So, when we miss the significance of the kingdom of Jesus, that the only message you preach, we can miss the significance of the kingdom for biblical righteousness and obedience. Can this be happening today? Are we seeing biblical righteousness? Or we're seeing man-made thinking on righteousness or obedience. Well, I'm trying the best I can. I'm trying to walk right, you know, but they know they're perfect. Have you heard that one before? Can I tell you that justification for? 
What is that justification? It's a justification by saying, I don't know who I am. I don't know how to walk in righteousness. I don't know the process of sin. So I'm going to justify that no one's perfect. And so no one can condemn me because in the same boat I am. What I'm here to tell you, I'm not in your boat with you. There's a higher standard if you understand the process of sin in your life. The pattern that is played out. Thought, choice, manifestation. Thought in the mind. Choice of the heart, manifestation in your flesh. When you understand it, you now know how to work by biblical righteousness and biblical obedience. Okay? Constitutional scripture. Second Timothy 2.15. Listen to this. Study. Remember, the whole goal of the kingdom, the message of Jesus, is for you and I to study. Not be told what the Bible said. Study it for yourself. Study to show yourself. You see, we got to stop relying on people chewing the word up making it much and giving it to us. While there's a place for it and there's a time for it, come a time when I got to take a hold of that fork myself, take the knife myself, cut the meat and put it in my own mouth. In other words, the study here means feed yourself. <laughs> so I can put another word, feed yourself. Show yourself approved unto God. A workman need not be ashamed. Why would you be ashamed? You will be ashamed if you realize at the end that the message you preach was the gospel without the kingdom and you live a far lower standard, stand before God and you, because you didn't study it out, you were told what to believe. So you will be ashamed when the test is going to, in the end, is going to be based on the, your knowledge of God's word. You see, that's on the test. It is written. And if it is written, it's your job of mine to find out what is written. So, if he commands you to study, to show you so approve, a workman need to be afraid, but rightly and accurately dividing. The word means, divide means to separate, right? To separate. In other words, take it apart, put it back together. The word of truth. What's truth? God's word is truth. So he said, you and I got to study and investigate it. Stop settling for what you've been told and question what you're told. Then study it and research it and come to your own conclusion. If what you have, they've told you is accurate, then you can agree because you've investigated. If you have not investigated, how can you agree by saying amen? I have a problem with people saying amen to what they don't know nor understand. Do you know by saying amen in a service of what is set up from that you don't understand? By law, you're called an accomplice. Did you understand what they said? No. A man's up front preaching about a whopper. I had a whopper. You don't understand what I said. I had a whopper. Right? Or I had a Big Mac. 2OB special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onion, and a sesame seed bun. Amen. Do what? Because he had a whopper? I'm just saying. So that word amen, I tell people, be call it, be careful how you use that. The word amen is agree, so be it, or I agree. And most of what we hear has been said is actually not biblical. So it's important for you and I to study to show ourselves, because why? When you discover the truth for yourself, your tenses will change from my pastor, Gary, or anyone that says to, I know. Why? Because you've discovered the truth for yourself. That's the key. Now, so how important was the kingdom of God to Jesus? Let's examine 10 ways Jesus related to the kingdom. 10 ways. How important was it for him? Everything that he did, everything that he said, came out of the kingdom. Number one, Jesus inaugurates the kingdom. With the coming of Christ, the kingdom begins not on the coronation of a mighty king, but in the birth of a crying baby. That was the coming of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of God is with you or amongst you. So the Jews was expecting a mighty king so they can coronate him because their book foretold of a mighty king who would defeat their enemy and give him rulership over the kingdom. And thus when Jesus came as a crying baby, they couldn't accept him. And so, yeah, yet as Jesus' ministry begins in Mark, he announces the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, he says, change your mind, change your thinking and believe. That's the challenge for us today, isn't it? We have been told, has been expecting, have been preached that the way he should come. Or what should be happening? But it says when he come, 
and it says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. The word at hand there means is here or is nearby you. Repent and believe in it. Yet they're rejecting and believing him because he didn't come the way they expected him. That's in Mark chapter 1 verse 15. What Israel had long awaited, Christ had now inaugurated. The word inaugurated may begin or introduce a new system, policy, or a new period in a different way than they expected him. They expected a ruling king. He came as a servant king. They expected a deliverer. He became a savior. Hmm, you understand? So when he showed up with a different message than what they've been preaching from the Torah, and they read the laws of the prophet every week up until John the Baptist and Jesus changed that message, they couldn't receive him because he didn't come as a ruling king. He came as a servant. And then he allowed himself to be beaten, to be abused, and finally be hung on the cross. Certainly not that couldn't be Messiah we expected. He's not the one, they say. Yet they would admit at a certain point, we know this man cannot do perform the miracle signs and wonder unless God be with him. But still we won't believe his message. Then Jesus had to make the argument with them. If you believe and claim Abraham is your father, Abraham, believe me, why don't you? You claim Moses. Moses gave you the law. You believe in him. Yet you don't believe me. Yet I was before those guys. I was before them. And they said, oh, he blasphemed. How dare he tear to make himself equal with God? And I'm wondering, in many of the churches today, should Jesus come back, would he be allowed in? Because we have a perception, a concept about him that may not line with our theology. Hmm. But the kingdom is the message. The kingdom will be the only message. And the only message that needs to be preached before he returns is the message of the kingdom. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all nations. And then the end come. The kingdom is the message, folks. And you have to start to study how kingdom come to existence. How kings rule. How the laws and decrees and citizenship. How that work in the kingdom. Number two. We examine in here the ten way Jesus really in the kingdom. Jesus is the kingdom. Where the king is, there is the kingdom. You see, a king doesn't need a build him or a castle to make him a king. A king make building his castle. So he's the, he's the carrier of the value. So the reason why Jesus didn't have to go back to heaven to get the authority and right to heal somebody or to deliver a man demon possessed was because he was the authority and the power of heaven. And wherever he was, the kingdom was present with him. So wherever he needed, heaven aligns and backed them with the power he needed in that. So where the king is, the, the kingdom is there present with him. Now you're going to understand the story when the disciples asked him, I said to you last week, that Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his head was his home. If you understand the concept, because the earth is the Lord and he's the king of all the earth, the whole earth belonged to him. He didn't need a building or a home. So when they asked him, Jesus, where are you staying? He said, well, foxes have holes. Birds have their nests, but the son of man have no place to lay his head that he called home. What he was trying to tell them is they have no place to stay. He was basically trying to tell them the whole earth is my home. Because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. It all belongs to me. So wherever I laid my head for that night is my castle. I don't need a designated location or a building to make me who I am. I made things into castle and make them important. That's what he was trying to tell them. So we see here, there is precisely why Jesus said to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. He was the care of the kingdom and while he was there, he was in the midst of them, yet they did not recognize him. Luke 17, 21 at um, Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Um, Gami Goldberg teaches, Jesus embodies the kingdom motive of God, people in God's place under God's rule. Let me say it again. Um, the, the gentleman name is Goldberg. He teaches, Jesus embodies the kingdom, the motive of God's people in God's place under God's rule. Jesus is both the faithful ruler and the righteous citizen of the kingdom. So he came to demonstrate power and authority in the kingdom of God. Mm, interesting. Yet most never understood this power. So he is the faithful ruler and he's a righteous citizen of his father's kingdom. Number three, Jesus purposes the kingdom. Jesus revealed that his purpose is to proclaim the kingdom of God has come. Jesus described his mission saying that 
He must preach the good news, that's the word gospel, of the kingdom of God according to Luke chapter 4 verse 43. He must preach the good news of God's kingdom, Luke 4 43. So the good news is of what? God's kingdom. He said he must preach it. 1 John verse 3, 3 verse 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 through 10. Jesus says, another kingdom message, he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. Now, here's the key why he came. For this purpose, underline the word purpose there, please. The Son of God was manifest or revealed that he might destroy the work of the devil. That's the one the reason why he came. There's two reasons why he came. To destroy the work of the devil. And the reason he had to do that destroy the work of the devil, was to take our kingdom authority back. Adam had abdicated or vacated the throne when he sinned against God in the book of Genesis. In so doing, Satan has taken his rightful place on the throne legally because he got him to sin and disobey God. And thus he had rulership of the earth. That's why he's called the prince of the world. He took rulership, which was given to Adam, birth for that reason, but when he abdicated or vacated the throne, the devil took it legally from him. Thus Jesus' purpose had to come. It was manifest that he might destroy the work. What was the work? He was killing, maiming, and injuring people. Life and death was in his hands. He had to take that power back. And in verse 9, Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Sin was the power of Satan. He got Adam to sin and he was teaching the world to sin. For his seed remains in him. In other words, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In other words, when does a transition take place from the fruit of unrighteousness and you now walk in the free gift of righteousness imputed to you through Jesus' death and defeat of the devil, then the seed of righteousness is now in you. However, that seed needs time to develop. The reason why you and many people struggle with walking in the before God because they have not known, because they have not a revelation that your sin nature, the day you receive Christ as Savior, has been replaced with a righteousness nature. Now, to develop the righteousness takes time. The sin body of sin is still attached, called your flesh. So we battle between the righteousness nature and the sin nature. God be trying to tell us, just like you didn't have a say in Adam making a decision to sin against God and pass on the sin nature to us, you will also not have a say in Jesus dying and imputing to you a righteousness nature. However, through the kingdom, knowledge, and revelation of the Holy Spirit, you have to develop the characteristics through repetition, the nature of righteousness. Thus, we struggle between righteousness and disobedience. Obey, disobey. Do right, do wrong. And so many times, sad part said, because we're so familiar with our sin nature, we tend to yield to that. So we don't feel worthy enough to receive this righteousness nature, which will be given to us, just like our sin nature was. And so we tend to get discouraged because I'm not meeting God's standard. Because in my heart, my mind, the law is written, and I'm not meeting up to it. And if we have not learned how to crucify flesh and learn how to walk in the spirit, then it seems like in many days in our life, our sin nature is winning over. And thus we become discouraged and think, I'm never going to get there. God, I don't know why you love me. I'm such a worm. I'm not good enough, we say. So our own mouth is negating what the Lord has given to us and done for us. He has imputed to you and me his righteousness nature. But in order to grow in that nature, you have to learn the process of sin and learn how to now walk in obedience, making the conscious choice to obey God, just like Jesus had to. To walk in favor with God with man. To shun evil, walk upright, and lean towards God. So that process takes time. So many of us don't see what God's building on the inside. Most of what we're seeing from the outside in instead of the inside out. Wow. So the purpose he came was to destroy the work of the devil, give you a kingdom authority, and your power back to rule over demons, the earth, and your five area of rulership. The second purpose it came so they may preach the message of the kingdom so that the Gentile can be incorporated in the promise of Israel. We are now engrafted in to that promise as the Gentile will believe Jesus by faith. 
And so now we have redemption through their rejection of this Messiah, Jesus. But he said in the scripture, but the Gentile will believe and they would receive me. That's actually in your scripture. Wow, if you understand it. Who's already been born of God does not sin. Right? If you're born again, you don't sin. You don't willfully anymore make choice to sin. For, for he says, for his seed, seed of what? With seed. The seed of righteousness. How did it come? Through the Holy Spirit, right? It's, is now, remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In other words, our natural nature is to lean towards God to walk in righteousness. So we now see in the kingdom of God, you have opportunity to get into kingdom living by walking right. Another constitutional scripture is Luke 4.43. Luke 4.43. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. See the two purposes there? So he came to destroy the work of the devil, and second, to preach the kingdom message to the Gentiles so that we too can be in promise. That's the two purpose why Jesus came. Now somebody said, but, 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 but Gary, what about the death of the cross? That's one that stops here to me. But, but, but Gary, what about the woman at the well? That's one that stops here to me. But, but Gary, what about dying? That's one that stops here to me. But that's not why he came. That's a part of the plan. But the purpose why he came, the reason why he was sent was for these two major purposes, if you understand it. So the two reasons why he came. And thus the other thing that took place the healing of the blind, raising the dead, the sick. That's all a part of the original plan. That's the process he had to go through to fulfill these, make sure these two purposes were done. And then later on, we'll be redeemed in. You understand the concepts. So we now see the working of the kingdom and how it was inaugurated in kingdom living. Jesus declares the kingdom. Through his word, Jesus explained the kingdom and invites people to enter into it. Hmm. There's this, in Matthew chapter 23, he said, the Pharisees, let me read, bring it up for you. I want to read this to you. Matthew 23, he speaks to the Pharisees. And he says something very funny most people never saw. Matthew chapter 23. He was warning the Pharisees. And he was talking about how they blocked the way of those who were attempting to enter into kingdom living. Hi, Annette, welcome aboard. And he says, you Pharisees, he said, woe unto you. Let me put another scripture. Uh, Matthew chapter 23. <laughs> Matthew chapter 23. Let me see what I have here for I just It just crossed my mind. I think I pulled up for you where he says, you yourself won't enter, but you block those who are trying to enter into kingdom living. Um, and he really condemned them on it. Uh, let me read here, verse 1 and 2. Uh, everything they do, let's see. Matthew 23, then Jesus said to the crowd and to the disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in the seats of Moses. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you pertaining to the law of Moses, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. That's the key. They do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome load on your shoulder, put them on other people's shoulder, but they themselves were not only willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their prosthetic or convert wide and tap, their, their phylacteries, I'm sorry, wide and tassel on their garment long. They love the place of honor and banquets and the most important seat in Singa. They love to be greeted and respected in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one, the word rabbi means teacher, you only have one teacher, for you are all brothers. Remember I kept on saying that to you? We are the same father, same family, we are brothers, right? And sisters. No one's better than the other to be called teacher, they're not. And do not be called anyone your father, for you have only one father, he is in heaven. That's your creator. The word God means creator, so it's to sustain that's your true father. Nor are you to be called instructor, for you have only one instructor, the Messiah, or the Spirit of God, the teacher. The greatest amongst you will be their servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. So he goes to the Pharisees. Here we go. Verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourself do not enter, nor will you let those who want to enter to go in. 
Are you seeing it? So the warning to us tonight is that you're going to watch who you're listening to. If they are the teachers proclaiming the message and they're not allowing you to enter kingdom, guess what they're doing? They're blocking out Jesus' only message. Through his word, Jesus explained the kingdom and invite people to enter into it. But you have those that will block you. Friends and family, religious people, people that claim to be your teachers will block you. They won't enter themselves, but they want you to enter. They don't want you to be set free. They need to be in bondage to them. And thus he warns you here. They shut the door of the kingdom in your face. They give you the gospel message without the kingdom. And they don't enter themselves. They won't go in. But they won't let you who want to go in to go in. They'll block you from entering into kingdom living. Luke summarized Jesus' ministry as proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, Luke chapter 8, verse 1. So the kingdom of God is amongst you, is there. It's a declaration of the kingdom often come through the parables of Jesus that illustrate what it was and how it works. The example it gives you in the kingdom of heaven is like, and I did the whole teaching on that aspect of it, my former teaching. What the kingdom is like in a physical form of an earthly example of a spiritual principle and a spiritual truth or revelation. So in following the kingdom message stepping in, we have to gain knowledge, understanding, and we need the teacher called the Holy Spirit to instruct us in the way of righteousness, obedience to the commandment or to the commands of the kingdom, the law pertaining to righteousness. So you'll find favor and good success in the presence of God. So you have to become a citizen, not a member. Now here's the key. You are a member of God's family, but you're a citizen of his kingdom. Okay? So let's define the term. So when you're a member of a church, a building, okay, you're not in the kingdom. Sorry. I know most of you want to say me when you hear me say, oh, you're in the kingdom. No, no, no. The church, the building, is not really God's house. Do you not know your body is my temple? You are the church of God. You know what I'm saying? My mom and I was talking about this afternoon. A few people was talking about how we have misinterpreted the word church to make it into a building location that they have now attached to that building location that if you're not in that place, you're not in fellowship. Bunch of hogwash. Jesus knew they would make that statement that if you're not in the building with a lot of people, you're not in fellowship. Hogwash. Poppycock is another word used there. Let me explain to you. Jesus said this, but I say, when you hear Jesus make a declaration, but I say, he's decreeing something new. You've heard it said, if you're not in the building, you're not in fellowship. But I say, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of you. Fellowship has nothing to do with the building location. The, the building is a training center. It's not God's church. Do you not know your body is my temple? You are the church of God. And fellowshipping, if you have one other, you're good with God. You're in fellowship, okay? Does want to fix that in some of the heads and the things I've heard. People make statement. Well, well, I know it's true. You don't have to be in the church to be the church, but you got to be in the church to be in fellowship. Oh, really? Hmm. Keep that double talk to yourself. I know better. When you walk in the Holy Spirit, He will tell you because the fellowship has to do with being being around people of like mind, like thinking, like understanding, and you get to sharpen each other. So I get it. But to get to a big box where they're picking your pocket. And taking your money. Because the bigger they gather, the more we can raise. <laughs> and then now attach God then to a box called a building. Let me say something. God does not dwell in buildings made by man's hand. So keep your box to yourself. When Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, And I will build my church. You hear the word? He didn't say man's going to build it for me. I said I'll build my own. Thank you very much. But the church is going to build now building a location. If you study Jesus walking and teaching this kingdom, the church was mobile. And the church wasn't a building, the church was the people. Study the book of Acts. Paul taught the church was the people that gathered to him. Because we have a misconception, we're associating fellowship with a building. When he said we have two or three of like mine, comes together. I'm in the midst of you, you are in fellowship. We need to make sure we get that straight in our head. So our concept of the church just kind of messes up. The word church in the Greek is the word ekklesia. The word ekklesia means one who's called out and separated unto God. So when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church based on what? Based on the revelation Peter got that Jesus was the Christ. 
Jesus says to him in Matthew 16, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. You know what he just declared there? He says, the rock that he talked about there wasn't a building made with rocks in it, or making Peter the first pope. That's what he was talking about. He said, the rock here, Peter, the word Peter in your Bible means rock. But the rock that Peter revealed was based on revelation. Jesus said, you didn't get this revelation by yourself. My Father in heaven revealed it to you. And upon that revelation that I am the Christ, I'll build my church based on the revelation by the Holy Spirit that I am the Christ, the anointed one, the breath of God. And because they walk by revelation and truth through knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, the gates of hell will not defeat them or rule over them or prevail against them. But if a man builds me a building, gather people without a revelation of who I am and how I work in the life of a believer, the gates of hell will prevail against them. Question? Question. Is most of our churches defeating the work of the devil, overcoming him, or is he prevailing against them? May I recommend you do a study of your church if you go to one of those boxes and look at the life of the people. Is it changed? Do they look any different than the world to you? Are they sick, maimed, blind, deaf, abused, divorcing, walking with brokenness? Does it look any different than the world to you? I think the gates of hell is prevailing because it's based on a religious understanding and not a revelation by the Holy Spirit. But I love the fact that Jesus said, I'll build my own church. I don't trust man to build me a church. I'll pick my own. Thank you very much. And the gates of hell that I build will not prevail against that church because it will not be based on a building location. It will be based on the revelations to who I am, how I work in the life of a believer to overcome life circumstances. I'll teach him how to walk in righteousness and obedience. i teach him how to walk in discipline, self-control. That's the church I'll build. And because they know how to control their minds, capture thought and imagination, bring it to the obedience of Christ or cast them down, they'll have the pure mind. And because they'll make the right choice of the heart, they will not choose to disobey God by willfully activating their choice to sin, but they'll choose to obey God. And they will not manifest sin in their flesh because they have the nature, now I just said to you early, of righteousness and have the nature being imputed into us through Jesus' death. And based on that understanding, you will overcome life circumstances. But if man build it, watch out. What I'm seeing coming out of the building, it's not what God's building. That's man's building, not his. So they put his name up there, put a bumper sticker, put a cross in there. That's not God's house. Sorry. I know some of you want to claim it. That's the church. No, it's not. That's a building with a big T out front. I'm not trying to offend people. I'm just telling you what it is because we never start to figure it out. You understand the cross that's in there didn't come from the Jews. You do know that, right? The cross in the churches was a Roman concept. That was the cruelest way they could crucify and kill a man. They make sure you suffer in your own juices and, and then you will literally drown in your own fluid. <laughs> I'm just saying. We have up front, the cruelest way a man could die came from a Roman concept, not even from the Jews. The Jews didn't crucify people. The Romans did. And they put it up front of you. Look, I'm seeing Jesus on the cross. I got Jesus on my necklace. We are so ignorant it's beyond comprehension. That's the cruelest way. So Jesus may have died on the cross once, but he never went back there. So he says, when you take the Lord's Supper, he don't say go back to the cross. Get away from the cross and live your life going forward to honor that event. He took that suffering for you and me at that one event, but he never want you to go back. You live your life now going forward in light of the price he paid to redeem you. But you don't go back to the cross. There is no longer any more sacrifice for a man if you trample his righteous blood underfoot. Okay? One death, one time for all times. One death, one time for all times. There ain't gonna be no more sacrifice. So going back, there ain't gonna get you no more blood. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus help us. There's some people stuck at the cross. They can't get beyond it. I don't know what you're doing there. You, Jesus left there. He never went back. What you doing back there? And I'll tell you what you're doing back there. Because you never learn how to walk in righteousness and discipline and self-control. You keep on violating God's law by sinning against him because you don't know who you are. Because you're in a boss called a religion. They don't teach you how your identity, your purpose, and your destiny. You live your life in light of your sin instead of life of your purpose and your future. You're looking backwards, you're not looking forward. That's why we keep going back there. Because we can't seem to measure up. So I need another application of the blood. Oh, send your blood, Jesus. How much sacrifice do you need? <laughs> 
I'm not going there. It's not my message. But I need you to understand. We got to get up from this thing. Your purpose and your destiny cries out to you. When you end up your life, you shouldn't live your life and die in the end of your life with regrets. If you live your life as a religious person and you get to the end of your life, you're going to question, did I do enough? Maybe I would have, should have, could have. You don't want those questions. If you live your life on purpose, then once you find your purpose, the original intent for your creation, then it provides for you a destiny. The desire, the destiny means the desired end. Your purpose, your destiny. And it gives you an identity as a citizen of God's kingdom so you know your identity, you know your purpose, and you know what your destiny is. I don't live my life as a Christian. I live my life as a kingdom citizen and I know my purpose, I know my identity, and I know my destiny. So every day I get up with expectation to live a greater life than I live today to honor God in how I manifest what he created me to do. You get it? So I'm never looking backwards. I'm always looking forward. Ah, Whew, let's continue. So we now see that Jesus demonstrated the kingdom through his work. He, Jesus showed the power of the kingdom and the authority over the prince of darkness. He defeated him, right? The prince of darkness. The word darkness here means lack of light. Another word that's used for darkness is ignorance. He's called the prince of ignorance. <laughs> If my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, why do you think it's called the presence of ignorance? If I keep you ignorant too, I can manipulate and control you. If I have you and convince you that the gospel is a half truth of the kingdom and I get you caught up in preaching the kingdom without the gospel, you are ignorant. You get it? That's what he's trying to tell us here. That's why it's called the prince of darkness. Because he keep people mind blocked out from the illumination or the light of God, which bring revelation and brings truth to you. Get it? As Jesus explained, if it is by the finger of God I cast out demon, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke eleven twenty. Jesus not only declares the kingdom in his word, but also demonstrates the kingdom in his work. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has manifested come upon you. Signs and wonders only show up when you preach the right message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is at hand. That's why he sent the disciples out two by two, delegated authority to them. And he says, when you go preach this message, he was very specific. He didn't make it general. He was very specific. And he gave them a command, not a suggestion, a command. A command means you have no room to deliberate or to question, just to obey it. And he said, preach this message, preach this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he said, after you preach that message, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demon, open blind eye, raise the dead, do what you need to do. So if there be signs and wonders, it's proof that the kingdom is present. If there be no signs and wonders, it's a proof the kingdom is absent. We are preaching a half truth, the gospel without the kingdom authority. You get it now? That's why there's no signs and wonder happening in many of our churches. Oh, we get a good message. Oh, we get some goosebumps. Oh, we get tinglies. Our hair and our hand raises. Oh, the Holy Spirit. Oh, see, the, the, the hair in my hand. Is that the measurement of the Holy Spirit now, goosebumps? Are we for real? <laughs> Oh Lord, let me not touch it. Let me not touch it. People don't think I'm going off the deep end. No, let me not touch that one. The measurement in church is goosebumps and flesh. Are we for real? Yet nowhere in the Bible, if you watch Jesus, in all the miracles perform, people show goosebumps. People got the tinglys. They actually see real sign, real wonders, real miracles, and it transformed their lives. Something's wrong. I'm just saying, what we're preaching today, something is wrong. Let's continue. Jesus deployed the kingdom. He deployed it, right? He didn't want to stay locked up in one place. He's expanded it. Jesus sent his followers out as ambassador of the kingdom to herald his arrival. We are called ambassador for Christ. Have you noticed that, that, that title ambassador? Why did he say you're a Christian for Christ? Why an ambassador? Well, an ambassador don't represent a church. An ambassador represents a nation. So if we're ambassador for Christ and you're a citizen, that means you're a citizen of a country. That means you're ambassador, ambassador of a country. I'm just saying. Look at the words, please, so you can understand this is kingdom terminology. America has ambassador all over the world. In every country, we have the United States Embassy in every nation on the planet. What do they send to govern them in that country? An ambassador. Who's he represent? The country he's from, not himself. 
So if you and I are followers of Christ, we are his ambassadors, where you came from heaven to represent God's kingdom on earth. That's why he had you birth here. Mm, oh boy, I can take him so much direction that in that direction, you have no idea. So he sent out the ambassadors of the kingdom to herald his arrival. This deployment happened in Luke 10 as Jesus sent out the 72, instructing them to say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. See there? He was very specific, wasn't he? He sent out the, the, the 12, he sent out the 72 in Luke 10, 9. The kingdom of God is near you. Remember I said to you earlier, that's what it was. In the Great Commission, Jesus, King Jesus issues his disciples battle plan to the church. The church represents the people because he possessed all authority in heaven and earth. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus sent his soldiers to the front line to engage the kingdom of darkness. So he sent them out to engage the work of the evil one. And he said, I give you upon authority over it. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Here's the part we misunderstand. Because he used there, go into all the world and preach the gospel, we misunderstood and think he was just talking about the good news. But he never used the word kingdom, so we automatically assume he wasn't talking about the kingdom. But you must understand, the people that he gave this instruction to was already living in a kingdom. Thus, they understood the word good news was of the kingdom. So he didn't have to repeat it. He just used the short form of it. And an example of this I keep repeating is when we use the word, we have the country of America is called the United States of America. What do we do? We use the short, short form, the U.S. Does everyone in America who is a citizen understand the word U.S. means United States of America? They automatically know. That's what was going on there. Okay. So he's sending them out to preach the gospel. And the gospel here represents the kingdom, right? So, if we understand the concept, so he sent them out two by two, preach the kingdom, and he said the kingdom to attack the darkness, why? Right? The ignorance, bring light to a darkened world. Let people know they can live a transformed life. Bring illumination, understanding, and power and authority to show them what they're capable of. I say over and over again, every miracle of Jesus that he demonstrate in the Bible wasn't for him. He came to earth to show you and me our authority, our power level. Remember he said something very funny. In heaven my will is done. On earth I need you to pray. My kingdom come, my will be done. Because why? Every miracle of Jesus was to show the sons of God your authority and your power level that you didn't know you have. Because sin had blinded us to the reality of who we really are. We were made in the image of God. We were not made in the image of angels. Okay? We have been given dominion authority to rule over them. Have you not read in the Bible where it says that the angel of God has been sent forth to do the bidding of the heirs of salvation? Who's he talking about? You and me. What did we receive? Salvation. He redeemed us from the curse of sin. Isn't that true? Now you understand. Next, Jesus transformed the kingdom. Israel Messianic hope focused on the coming military conqueror. There's the word. That was their hope, right? They read the Torah every week, every Sabbath day, about the conquering military conqueror who would rescue them in their geopolitical and, and, then, and then rescue them from their geopolitical enemy. At that time, it was the Romans, right? They were ruling Israel, ruling over the Jew. So their hope and their focus in this messianic hope was that this conquering military conqueror would come and set them free and over and kicked out their enemies and give them rulership. That is why they sought to make Jesus king in John 6, 15. But Jesus reoriented, reoriented, reorient their vision by declaring, my kingdom is not of this world. Hmm. John 18, 36. Jesus transformed the kingdom, showing it to the Showing it is the whole or complete in its nature. It is redemptive. Redemptive here meaning acted to save someone from error or evil. It is a, it is his mission and it's infinite, limitless in its scope. So the kingdom of God has no limit. It is the mission. It is infinite. Um, but the whole idea is also redemptive. It's wants to redeem the citizens back to the kingdom of living. Father wants his children back home. Your citizenship is not on the earth. Your citizenship is in heaven. You were spirit before you were flesh. You and I was made out of God. He didn't make you from the angel. 
He make you similar, but he didn't make you in the image of the angel. He make you the image of himself. Mm. So you're literally sons and daughters of the king. You're born in his power. So he made us like himself. But because Adam sinned, he never taught his sons and daughters how to operate in kingdom authority and rulership on the earth. Sin came in and it basically it crippled us to rule over the five areas of dominion power. Fish, bird, air, animal, ground, creeping thing, and atmosphere. That's been given to us to rule over it. That's what the authority was. When we lost our identity, lost the teacher and structure, then we got submitted to the environment and the environment that ruled over us. That's why prior to Jesus coming, when someone was sick, we felt so um, little and small, we could do nothing about it. When someone died, we thought death was the end. When someone got sick, we know it could be sick unto death. We couldn't heal them, we didn't thought it was possible. When there was a drought, we thought we were going to starve to death because why we knew we could control the environment, control the rain. When someone was in trouble or needed a healing, we didn't thought it was possible until Jesus came to demonstrate it. That's why he's called the Son of Man. Because man was where the problem we're having. Man didn't know what he was capable of. Man didn't know his power. And the devil was very good in keeping us inept, incapable, and weak. Because then he can manipulate. The same idea as he says, woe, Matthew 23, unto the Pharisees. Woe unto them. They're eight W-O-E in Matthew chapter 23. Now, why is he woeing? The worst word you ever want to level against you in your Bible or in God's mouth is this three letter word woe that word is a hard word it is a punishment word it's a damning word so I recommend you research it out and study it out and we have eight woes here against the teacher could it be the reason why we continue in such weakness and living so low is because we listen to the wrong teachers could it be the reason why we have no power no authority we can't overcome anything we're weak we're still sinners by the way I don't get that one. If our nature was changed from a sin nature to the righteous nature, why are we still calling ourselves sinners? You're not a sinner. You're a saint. But we can't live up to sainthood because I'm still struggling with my flesh. Oh, I can take it through and explain this whole process. When you receive Christ, your nature was changed. The problem we had is that you didn't realize you still have the body of sin attached. Your suit still has sin in it. Sin was not eradicated. Sin was blotted out. Your nature had changed. Your inner man. Not your outer man, your inner man. The flesh to be functioning on the planet must have a third suit, the outer man called the flesh. So it makes you a viable and make you legal on the planet to operate in your dirt suit. But it still contains sin in it. And thus because the sin is so close to us, we are battling inwardly as to which is going to take control. My flesh or the spirit? My flesh or the spirit? And every day we are caught in between trying to make a choice. Which way will we go? Now, the flesh is very smart in knowing that we have so practiced certain patterns of behavior that when it wants to stir us up, he stirs up a memory, a motion, or a desire, or something that goes on. And so the flesh gets activated. We don't know how to control it because we've always given into it, right? When we're in sin in the world, we just gave into flesh. There was no such thing as bad or good. It's just enjoyment and entertainment. We just loved it. But now God says, get some control, sir, man. Control yourself. But now the Spirit is giving us the power to do that, but with flesh is fighting. It doesn't want to do that because I like to have it my way. And so we have to fight. And so in this tug of war in us, the war rages not out there. The war rages between here and here, mind and the heart. And so because of that, we feel that we can't call ourselves saints. And because most of the time we are failing in the battle because we're yielding to sin, it's natural to call ourselves sinners because the sinners justify why I'm failing God. But God doesn't call you or see you a sinner. He sees you saints, sons, citizen, brethren, brother to Jesus. Now, we can't accept that because I'm not there yet. God, how can you call me that? Well, God don't call out what he doesn't know is going to manifest. He always call out the end at the beginning. He sees in you the title he's calling you. He never speaks to you where are you from your past. He's always speaking to you from your present and to your future. So if you call your saints, that means you're going to become that. You may not know how the process but if he's calling you that, that's who you are going to become. Because he completed you and finished you before he started you. And he said the finish at the end of your life. Okay? So there are woes here. Woe to the teacher. So the warning in Matthew 23 is woe to those who are teaching you. If they're teaching the gospel of that kingdom, woe to the teacher, law, the, the teacher of the law of Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win one single convert. And he says, then when you succeed in converting them to your way of thinking and acting, you make them twice the month the child us of hell as yourself. Did you notice here? He said they're going to take you to heaven. He said they're going to take you to hell with them. The blind lead the blind. Do you understand why he woe them? 
why he damned them? Because they're blind. They think they're following God's law, but they're misleading the people. Then they're converting people their way of thinking. They convert means they transform in one way of thinking to their way of thinking. But when they come over to them, they promise you success. But instead, they make you now a child of hell as themselves. So, do you know what Jesus just said here? Many teachers you listen to ain't leading you to heaven. They're leading straight to hell. So be careful who you listen to. <laughs> I'm just saying. Woo, Jesus. Let me leave that one alone. Blind leaders of the blind. He calls them. Teacher Pharisee hypocrites. You tithe, spice, mint, dill, cumin, but you have neglected the more important matter of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without rejecting the former. You blind guys, you straight out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. <laughs> They focus on the small thing, but the big thing they don't see. Blind. So the kingdom of God, why it's important for us to get it, is that we must understand the kingdom is present. Your eyes need to be open to see. Hmm. Word number eight. Jesus purchased the kingdom. Through his victorious death and resurrection, Jesus redeemed the kingdom. As he satisfied the wrath of God, poured out for those who rebelled against his rules, Jesus defeated Satan's sin and death. There's the word. So through his victorious death and resurrection, he redeemed the kingdom back. And why did he redeem it back? Because he had to give it back to you and me. You see, we're living on an earth ruled by the prince of this world called Satan, who took the, uh, the throne from his predecessor or the one who was given to call Adam. When Adam abdicated the throne, he had rulership. And what he brought to the world was sin and death. So, it's been given to us to shape it into the image of God and what God had wanted in heaven to make the earth look like heaven. Satan now blinded that. That's the reason had he come. Because this happened in the realm of the spirit. He had to be defeated in the realm of the spirit to take our authority back. And then he gave that to mean authority back to you. But if we continue to think that the message is the gospel, which is a half truth, mixed in a bunch, the best way to tell a lie is mix a, a lie in amongst a lot of truth and they'll never know the difference. And that's the reason why the world's struggling. According to Colossians 2, 14 and 15. He overcame the world, Jesus, the flesh, and the devil by destroying the power of the kingdom of darkness. He's got a kingdom too. How is it Satan's the kingdom? He ain't got no church. <laughs> He's got a kingdom. He's lived in some church. is a temporary thing, a building. Please, I don't want that. That's not eternal. I want the big things. I want the kingdom of darkness. By purchasing the kingdom, um, by purchasing the kingdom, people at the cross, Jesus proved himself to be the rightful ruler and restored the kingdom back to man's authority. Then he gave the keys of the kingdom to his sons, which is in Matthew chapter 16. He said to Peter, and because of Revelation, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And he said, when you have that key, whatever you bind, now the word bind means lock up on earth, shall be locked up in heaven. Whatever you loose, unlock on earth, shall be unlocked in heaven. So he gave us the keys of the kingdom, right? And the sons and daughters of the citizen to rule over it in his place. So he gave us the keys back to get our authority back. But it comes through knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and a changed mind. Changing the way we think. Changing our the information we receive. Studying that out. Making sure what they're teaching us align with scripture as to what Jesus did. If it's an example, we're following in word and in deed. And thus he gave and restored the kingdom back so we can take dominion over the earth. Now, let me tell you what's happened. Ever since the time of us losing the kingdom, many religion has risen up. Seem like many have so risen up that each one have a piece of God. So God is now divided between the Protestant, the Methodist, the Baptist, the Pentecostals, the um, Catholics, the Mormons, the different ones. They have they just divide God into peace because they have their own little corner of truth, you know. They have their little little God in their little box or little Jesus in their box. God is one, he's not divided. He doesn't fit in the building made by man's hand. So they have a concept in a religious system that they think they have the kingdom. So they're now learning that they can attach the kingdom to what they're doing and think somehow that's the kingdom of God without understanding or knowledge. 
When you use the word kingdom, you must define your term. If you use it as a general term without they understand what it is and how it functions, then you are misrepresenting the kingdom of God. But many are attaching to kingdom finances, kingdom banking, kingdom business, kingdom preaching, kingdom this, kingdom that, and they have no concepts. And you know what I listen for? I listen to how they define their term. Define the kingdom for me. If they can't define it right, they ain't got the kingdom. They have the word, but they ain't got the kingdom. <laughs> and by the way, you can't enter the kingdom unless it's revealed to you. Until it's revealed by the Spirit of God who opened your eyes to see it, you can't see it. You can't bump into it. You can't walk into it. You can't seek it and find it and just drop into it. The Lord must reveal it to you. Then he'll give you the desire to seek it. And then you will find it. That's the key. Let me finish up. Oh, let me pick up my pace here. All right. Number nine. Jesus concludes with the kingdom. In his final word to his people, Jesus concluded in, in his earthly ministry by clarifying the kingdom. Just before his ascension, Jesus decided to ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You notice what they asked for? Restore the gospel to Israel? The good news? No. Restore the kingdom to Israel. Acts 1 6. Even at the conclusion of his earthly ministry, Jesus resolved, resolved confusion about the kingdom. So the kingdom was key to the start of Jesus' earthly ministry and in its culmination. After he died, came back to life, and resurrected, he preached the kingdom for 40 days and gave them final instruction about the function within that kingdom. Not the gospel. If the gospel was the message, would he not put in the Lord's prayer? Our Father in heaven, holy, holy is your name, your gospel, good news, come. That's not what your Bible said in Matthew chapter 6. That's what it says. Your kingdom come. Isn't that what it says? There it is. So because most don't understand the kingdom is the message, they're stuck in the gospel and the gospel is not working. Because if you have the introduction without the next step of the kingdom, then there's no power demonstration. Number 10 here. We're in a good time. Number 10. Jesus returns the kingdom. In the second coming of Christ, right, the second coming, Jesus returned as a triumphant warrior king. That's where Matthew Revelation comes into play, Matthew Revelation chapter 20, where there's a name that's stamped on him, King of King, Lord of Lord. He come back with a sword in his mouth that cuts man to pieces. As he returned to achieve the final victory, the name described on his body is King of Kings and Lord of Lord. Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. King of kings, Lord of lords. Now question become, who is he talking about? When you read that king of kings, he ain't talking about King Abdullah, even though he's a king on the earth. He's one of the kings. But you and I and all the people of earth, if they ever come to understand what kingdom means, are kings of the earth. Hmm. So the king of heaven comes down to rule over the kings of the earth. And Lord mean owner and master of, the Lord, owner and master of heaven and earth comes down now to join the owner and master of earth because he gave us dominion power with earth. So the king of kings and he's the Lord, high Lord over the lower lords. We just never understand. So by position, and positionally, we are kings and queens. Positionally, we are lords over the earth. That's what we were given. Two kings do not reign in the same realm. If you go to your father's house in heaven, you're not a king there. That's his domain. You are a prince or princess, but you're not a king. You're only a king in your own territory. When you leave the father's house and you go to the father's you're the sons or daughters, prince or princesses. When you leave his house, come back to your own territory. There you are a king. And the people subordinate to you call you your majesty, your highness, Almighty King, they'll call you that. But two kings don't dwell in the same domain. On the earth is where your dominion lies. That's why we think we're going to sit up in heaven, sit by Steve with Jesus for all eternity. While you're going to have access to heaven, it's not your dominion power. You cannot stay in your father's house. Just like your parents here recognize, somewhere along the line, you got to kick that big old 31-year-old man or woman out your house. Why? They need to learn to walk on their own and establish their own dominion. Thus God says, if the earth, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, and I gave you rulership over the earth, then your dominion power lies on the earth. 
except now on the second heaven, second earth, the Son of God, the Son of Man, will dwell amongst men and shape the earth into the righteous image or vision God had originally had for the earth. Except on this earth and this present earth, there will be no sin, no unrighteousness, no weapons, no war. You get it? So it's about our dominion power. At last, he places all his enemies under his feet as he launches a new creation kingdom that fully reflects his righteous reign. He wants a righteous earth, a righteous rulership of man. He consummated the, the conquest that began with his birth. So there's going to be an established heavenly kingdom on earth for a thousand years. He rules the earth with a rod of iron and he rules with men. To my reason why the question you have to ask, why is he here? To show the sons of men how to walk in righteousness and to rule in righteousness. He is the example they will follow, and no longer shall he leave them. So if you understand this kingdom rule of Jesus, how to enter in, you have to gain knowledge, understanding, wisdom as to your authority, your power, your purpose, your destiny, and that lies within you to manifest God's kingdom on earth. Yes, final, final statement here. If the kingdom of God was central to Jesus' life and ministry, then it remains crucial to our thinking and obedience today. Would you agree? So, it is time to make a decision. If the message of the Bible is the gospel without the kingdom that most church teaches, then choose that or continue in that. But if the message of the Bible is the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus and all his disciples taught, then choose that and enter into kingdom living today. But make a decision and make a choice. But the idea, we are coming to the place where the Lord is leaving up to us. Which way will we go? I set before you two paths. Life, death, blessing, cursing, the kingdom or not the kingdom. The gospel or the kingdom of God. So he sets before that path that we must choose. If the kingdom is the right message, then you got to choose to seek it out. Seek first, first means priority, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all that you need shall be added unto you. It would never be a priority if you already had it. But if it said to seek it first, that means everything that you need in this life comes out of kingdom living, kingdom knowledge, kingdom revelation, kingdom truth, kingdom power, kingdom authority. We've been told the message is the gospel, but I'm here to tell you the message is not the gospel. The gospel is of the good news. It's the good news of the kingdom. That's the good news. So if we don't have the concept right and the way to change our mind, change our thinking, we've got to be willing to humble ourselves and say, I really don't know. I know I hear what Gary's saying might be true. And I may not necessarily agree with everything he says, but what he says makes sense. And when I've stepped into it, so an invitation is given to us all. If the kingdom is present, it's near you, is at the door, then we have a choice to choose to step in or to stay out. But you cannot mix the kingdom with religion. It doesn't work. It's going to create a conflict. You're going to know too much. You're going to understand too many things. Especially when you start to investigate and study for yourself and research. When you start questioning what you've heard, what they've told you. It's not going to make sense to you if they tell you without researching it. It is not true anything you hear until you research it for yourself. Then you shall know the truth and that truth will set you free. So I'm challenging you to check out what I'm telling you. Research it. Ask the question. Is the message the kingdom? What was Jesus' message? Is it truly taught? Is the kingdom the right message, the only message? Or is there another message? And I'm here to tell you, now the kingdom start to expand. In the time that we're in right now, people are looking for a safe haven, a place to rest. They've tried the churches. Many of the people who are enemy of the cross is because they went to the building. They went to find Jesus. But the example that they saw set before them didn't match up to the Jesus they read of the Bible. And thus they reject the Bible and reject the Jesus and especially God. Not because they don't want God. It's because the, the witnesses and the example they've seen turn them off. And thus they want nothing to do with God or religion is what they'll say. That's under attack right now. That's going on right now. But when they found out the message of the kingdom and they find it be truth and it works, they will all run to it and will run right to it. And that's what the Bible tells you. In the kingdom, the prostitute and the sinners will enter the kingdom before most religious people. Why? Because they're searching for the truth. They don't want the counterfeit. And I think many who have been in the building long enough are realizing there's something off. Something's not right. I don't know what it is, but something just don't feel right. 
Well, it's time to investigate what is not right about it. Deep down in your inner man, you know something's off. You will not say it because we've been convinced that's the only option to get to God. I'm telling you, it's not true. There's another option. There's a higher standard. There's a better way and there's an easier way. Jesus said the best. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Take my spirit that's within you, which is the care of the kingdom. Learn from me, do it my way, become a child again. And I'm telling you, I won't burden you down with religious activity, serving, working, laboring, chilling, turn, and get no result. But my take my yoke, learn from me, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I encourage you tonight as I teach this message, the final session on this month, that you take this message and listen to it again. Step into this kingdom living. It's real. It works. It sets you free. Mind, soul, and body. And then you live life on purpose with a destiny in mind. So at the end of your life, the Lord can say to you, well done. I finished the race. I've emptied out. Now I can go home in peace knowing there's no regrets inside of me saying I woulda, coulda, shoulda, but I've done it all. That's the hope of every believer. So get that hope tonight. God bless you all. We love you. Look forward to seeing you again next week. I may be teaching a new series. Don't know not what that yet. I'm studying some stuff right now, but I'm sure I'll have something new for you. God bless you all. Hope you enjoyed the session. Please go back and listen to it again. Get the foundation of it. Step into kingdom living. Start to do your research. Investigate. Seek the Spirit of God. Let Him open your eyes and your ears. You may hear and you may see. God bless you all. We love you. Look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye now.